Right, I will start the session. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here today to this session in the Australian Circular Economy Conference together with the University of Sydney's Net Zero Initiative. Together with my co-chair, Professor Ali Abbas, acting head of school in chemical and biomolecular engineering and recently appointed chief circular professor or chief circular engineer in Australia. So it's a great pleasure to, to uh, welcome all of you here today on behalf of all of us present here. And it's a great pleasure, it will be my great pleasure soon to invite Dr. Stuart McGill to come up to the front. So I'll introduce him when he does so, when we do so. You with Dr. Mobin Nomvar and Dr. Mark Apthorpe. So, Move, without too much further ado, we will do what we usually do in these sorts of situations and move to the second slide and acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia, recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. We are currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and future. Okay, so that is the introductory slides. I'm going to take a personal view for a start and explain to you the something a little bit about the program that we have in chemical and biomolecular engineering and what it's got to do with the circular economy. MIPS stands for the Major Industrial Project Placement Scholarship Scheme. This is a scheme that we have in chemical engineering. It was developed by Emeritus Professor Rolf Prince 22 years ago. It's our premier undergraduate program in chemical and biomolecular engineering. It has an important outreach and interaction with industry for academics and students. The student experience is firmly embedded in the undergraduate degree. The student gets a scholarship for six months in industry. The main project is an embedded applied research project for the company. They also do case studies, which are risk management, project management, design, flow sheeting. So they don't miss out on fourth year material. And it's an integrated experience working full-time in industry while studying at uni. It's not compulsory, but the first class on the students, the top third of the class do the best. And there's a whole range of companies from the food to the gas, to the water sector, to pulp and paper, and increasingly about a third in regional and rural and regional New South Wales, mainly connected with water projects, although most of those projects have wider environmental and sustainability contexts. So what's this got to do with a circular economy, you ask? Well, it's a little bit unusual this year, it's hadn't happened rather suddenly. In fact, we've dropped off a cliff in a way. Prior to this, the first 21 years, we had many more students than we had projects. This year, we've got many more projects than we have students. This is being driven by huge demand for circular economy, sustainability, environmental engineering type projects, net zero type projects. So, Hence our driving force here for the talent shortage. And so we're, we're faced with this issue too. I guess we're facing it from the university's perspective, but I guess it's a problem for the industry too, because we've got industry partners out there who we're having to go back to and say, terribly sorry, but we can't provide you with a student this year. That's not a good position for us to be in. So, Hence, hence, we're driving this, this discussion here today. We're not expecting to save the planet overnight, but we've certainly got to get moving when it comes to doing something about it. So, sorry about that. Okay. Right. Okay, so that's enough from me. Now, was that 12 minutes or under 12? I hope it's under 12. I always believe in, in saying a little bit less is more at times, and I could talk, talk forever. 
But it's actually a pleasure now to get into the actual discussions themselves, because I think it would be great to have a significant discussion from each of our panelists here, and then hand over to the audience for some Q&A. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Stuart McGill. Dr. McGill has a bachelor's degree and doctor of philosophy in chemical engineering from the University of Sydney. In 2008, he was recognized with the Chemical Chemica Medal Award of Excellence by the Australian New Zealand Federation of Chemical Engineers. In 2018, he was admitted to the degree of Doctor of Engineering, honoris causa, by the University of Sydney. He commenced his career in the energy industry in 1969 when he joined ESSO Australia as an engineer in their production department. During his career, Dr. McGill lived and worked in Australia, Europe, Southeast Asia and America. At retirement, he was Senior Vice President of ExxonMobil Corporation, member of the Corporation's Management Committee, and responsible for the upstream, global upstream businesses, including exploration, development, production, gas and power marketing, and research. Dr. McGill is a fellow of the Institution of Chemical Engineers, a fellow of the Institution of Engineers Australia, and a life member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. He is a member of the Leadership Council of CEDA, Committee for Economic Development of Australia. And at Sydney University, he serves on the advisory board of the John Grill Institute for Project Leadership, School of Project Management, and chairs the STEM Teacher Enrichment Academy Advisory Board. He has also served on the boards of the university's Chemical and Biomolecular Foundation, and the Warren Centre for Advanced Engineering. Thank you very much, Stuart, for coming along today. I invite you to the podium to discuss your perspective on this talent shortage. Stuart. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Can we Stuart, I have the technology. Uh, let's just stop here. Stop here. Okay. There we go. Okay. Oh, you've you've already heard the uh, the dilemma that uh, we're faced with, which uh, is not a uniquely Australian dilemma, and that is a shortage of uh, highly qualified STEM people, people who are competent in the STEM disciplines and can apply those disciplines to the, the world in which we live. And about 10 years ago, uh, there was a discussion here at uh, Sydney University about well, what is the university doing and can it do something more? And out of that discussion, uh, not very surprisingly, came the very, very clear conclusion that if you want to increase that pipeline of talent, <clears throat> then you need to focus on the teachers because the teachers can in fact multiply. They can deal with 30, 40 students at a time. Uh, we have in Australia and other parts of the world, I think some fantastic programs for talented students and we shouldn't stop those. Those, those are very important, but they don't grow the size of the talent pool. They, they enhance the, size, the, the talent pool that exists. And so the, the focus for the STEM Teacher Enrichment Academy at Sydney University was to increase the size of the talent pool. And in order to do that, uh, those who were more expert than I am uh, in that space uh, were very, very clear that that process needed to start no later than in primary school. And then in, in has a chance of then having a feeder stream in high school to then enhance that, that feeder stream through high school. So as a consequence of that, the STEM Teacher Enrichment Academy was established at Sydney University. It is an academy that focuses on experienced STEM teachers. This is not for undergraduates. This is people who are out there in the teaching world actually teaching. And it has two uh, components to it, two major components. One is focused on primary school teachers, which is the feeder pool. And the second one is on high school teachers. 
which is where there's, there's an attempt to make some enhancement. It is primarily not focused on content education. That is the discipline and the responsibility of the faculties at the university. This is focused on teaching skills. So it's, it's all of the techniques that are used to enhance knowledge of a student population uh, rather than the, the teacher learning the knowledge themselves. They, it's not zero content uh, education, but only if it's something that's very new do we get into content education. It is nearly all about how best to teach the subject so that it communicates. There are some features of the, uh, the academy that uh, the university regards as very important. <clears throat> um, when we go to uh, ask schools as to whether they would wish to participate, and that's for about half of the participants, the other half are knocking on the door. Uh, they've said they've heard about it and, and they would like to, uh, to be involved. Um, so when, when we talk to the schools, what, what it, criteria, rules of thumb, we don't want one teacher from the school. We want preferably six, two maths, two science, two TAS teachers from the school so that there is critical mass when they return. Another feature of the program, which is a little bit unique, is that the, uh, the teachers have to make a, a full application to, uh, to come into the program is to answer the simple question of, why do you want to join the program? What, what is it that you think that you need and you think this might, might provide it for you? Uh, so th that, and when they make that, um, that application, uh, a very important criteria is that it has to be submitted to the university and signed by the principal of the school. Because in this STEM space, one of the big issues, which is gradually being um, whittled down, is that the maths teachers prefer to teach maths, the science teachers prefer to teach science, and the TAS teachers prefer to teach TAS. But that's not the world we live in. STEM is a team sport. <laughs> it's not an individual sport. It has individual components, but the sport itself of producing an outcome, a result that matters, is a team sport. And so uh, we, we absolutely insist that the principal of the school signs it because when the teachers return to the school, the only person who can in fact make the value judgments about how classes are broken up, how lessons are programmed, which one gets the first, which one is the principal. So the principal has to have skin in the game right up front. Now, with that as a general uh, dimension, the other dimension that, that uh, has proven to be unique and very, very important to the schools is every school gets a tutor for the duration of the time period that they're involved with the academy. And the tutor doesn't call the school students in, the tutor goes to the school and spends time in the school with the teachers helping them implement what they decided they wanted to do when they were here uh, under the, uh, the auspices of the university in the program. And, and that has proved probably the most valuable component if you, if you uh, were to ask the teachers out there in the, in the real world, uh, the, the access to a, a tutor who is available, not instantaneously, but generally speaking is available and will come to your school and help you sort out how to do these things better. So all of that is, uh, <clears throat> has worked very well. Uh, people were a little bit concerned at one time about uh, how you got people to uh, apply for this uh, program. Um, that I assure you is not a concern. There's a waiting list uh, is the way it uh, works now. And I had thought, that after about 10 years, we might have worked through a fairly large component of the, the STEM teachers, and we have, but there's always more, <laughs> always more. And so uh, the, the program is, <clears throat> as I said, in its, in its ninth, ninth year, 
uh, and it's, it's going very, very strong. The other aspect of the program, which is different than a university course as such, it's uh, intended to develop a, a cohesive group of people who will learn from each other. In other words, they'll stay in contact with each other. And the, and the way we've promoted that is that there is a quarterly uh, newsletter that uh, goes out and it has all of the, the stuff that uh, the university has access to in it. But the purpose of the newsletter, quite frankly, is to maintain cohesion amongst the group of people who've been through the program. Uh, they haven't all been to the same program, so they don't necessarily all know each other, but we hope, and it seems to be working, there is a, uh, uh, I'll say, a, an emphasis on talking to people who've been to the program who might have a good idea. Uh, and I, tell, I assure you, a lot of the good ideas come from other teachers. Um, some schools just have a, a person in there who's got a bent for something. The intent is that that then flows across this, uh, this group of people without any further interaction on the part of the universe. So, so it's doing very, very well, strong, um, like all things in the real world. It's a question as to who is going to fund it uh, as we look down the, down the path. And it, would, it surprised me uh, when we started, one of the biggest inhibitions of uh, principals sending teachers to the program was that they had to source the relief teaching and they had no funds to do that. So the university started the program by funding the relief teaching for New South Wales Department of Education. Seems a bit backward, <laughs> but that was necessary to get it off the ground. Uh, all schools uh, in New South Wales have access to it. In other words, it's the public school system, it's the independent school system, the Catholic school system, and, and they all uh, participate vigorously. Uh, the independent system and the Catholic system do better in terms of funding uh, relief teaching, but the New South Wales Department of Education has now introduced a, a small pot in the principal's pocket and principals who really want their STEM teachers to go to the, the program actually have a pocket to go and fund some relief teaching to make it work. So that's, that's a step in the right direction. It's filled a big hole before. So I think that's enough for me about what the program is and what it's doing and uh, uh, how successful it's got off the ground. I have to say that we've been extremely fortunate We've had two directors of the program, one the first five years and one's in her fourth year. Um, and they have done a magnificent job, just a magnificent job of, of this program. Uh, and uh, as a little anecdote on the side of that, when we started, there was a strong view that we needed to recruit somebody from somewhere else in the world to run this program. Fortunately, we failed with that because I think we could not have done better than the, uh, the two directors, one that's retired and one that's there now in the program. Thank you. That's a great presentation, great insight into the situation. And thank you once again very much for all of that. We'll come back at the end with questions and answers, but uh, it's a great way to get us going. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, now I'm going to introduce Mobin Nonvar to, to his presentation, but we have a small bio from him too. Uh, Mobin grew up in Iran, but he developed a, and he developed a love of engineering, creativity, and building new tools and projects that were far beyond his schooling and grade level. As an adult, he has taken that curiosity and will to learn, grow and practice true craft of engineering, and turned it into a fast-growing career as an entrepreneur. Mobin founded Scimitar Ventures in 2016. Scimitar Ventures is an award-winning technology development and commercialization firm. Scimitar discovers and develops innovative solutions to the world's most pressing problems. 
operating on the verge of an entrepreneurial, scientific and engineering thinking, Sumitar strives to hit the right balance between technical and commercial excellence in every project it undertakes. The primary focus on future energy, circular economy, and materials manufacturing. Sumitar has built a reputation for fast and reliable delivery of commercial ready innovative projects to organization, to help organizations innovate, adapt, and grow in a fast changing global environment. Sumitar's purpose is to create technology and business innovation that leave a lasting positive impact with a focus on sustainability and commercialization. At Scimitar, Mobin's mission is to build on Scimitar's reputation as a dependable team of creative and daring, technical and commercial individuals who can reliably and quickly discover and develop innovative solutions to solve the world's most pressing problems. Mobin, please, welcome to the podium for your presentation. Thank you, Tim. Um, just take a moment to bring up my... Um, Slide, Thomas, if you help me with that. I have technology options here. They'll be probably be put on the desktop, so I can. Okay, just get rid of my presentation there. Okay. On the desktop. Oh, yeah, presentation. Splendid. Be able to sorry share the screen. It should be this one. You yeah, share the screen. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, I start my presentation by um, uh, showing you a um, and the uh, rather interesting uh, photo. So I think in the future of net zero initiative and circular economy, um, good talents are celebrities. And that is uh, what I truly think is going to be the future um, that we're heading to. So with that, um, I'd like to, um, okay, let's start with um, sharing two important um, uh, you know, graphics and information. So the first is what does really net zero means um, for all of us. So this is um, uh, some um, split of how we should reduce our carbon emissions uh, across the economy. Uh, this is uh, being presented uh, as a pathway towards a one and a half degrees uh, global warming. Uh, and effectively it means that there is around 37 gigatons of carbon dioxide that needs to be removed from our economy. Now, as you can see, it's got 25% renewables on it. 25% from energy efficiency comes, um, and then 20% electrification. We've got 10% from hydrogen economy, and we've got around 20% uh, that has been considered for carbon capture, different types of carbon capture. Now this, if you look at very carefully, you see that the amount of carbon dioxide that we have to remove from our economy touches every single aspect of our lives, from how we drive, how we eat, how we warm up our places, um, how we drive around, uh, how we get rid of our waste and manage that, uh, every single aspect, how we manage our land, um, all of them are part of the picture. Now, what does circular economy means? So obviously we've got uh, Australia's chief circular economy engineer here, so I don't have to <laughs> show anything on the slide, but I just want to, um, uh, touch on that uh, in a sense that as you can see on the right hand side of this figure, this is just one of the representations, there are many of them around, um, that we've got the user side and uh, on the left hand side, we've got the uh, collection of consumer side. And on the very top, we've got energy and fi you know, finite materials, um, stock management, renewable flow management. As you can see in this diagram, in a circular world, everything is connected. Now, Circular, circularity is not a new concept. It's been around for centuries and thousands of years. What you're living now um, is a consequence of rapid growth um, and uh, more and more um, the economy that we have created. So we are now found that, oh, there is a problem with that. So we have to um, look back at what we've been doing and take this uh, concept um, forward uh, in a new way. It is highly complex economic situation that we've got. 
So these two pictures, I'm, I'm hoping the message that I'm sending across that shows how holistic should be our approach towards net zero um, um, targets and circular economy. Now, what are the talents gaps or talents needs that we think exist um, from our own practice um, that we are seeing every day? So I've got some, uh, this slide is by no means exhaustive. Uh, there are many sectors that are being left out from this slide, but I'll show you and walk you through one by one what it means. The first one on the top that I want to share with you is the talents that we need in the government, policy, regulation, and standards. These are the people, these are the talents that are in charge of setting the minimum expectations and setting the targets. This is a reality now. We've got products that cannot be sold in the Australian market because we don't have the standards for them to give users the confidence that they need for safety and, and, and regulations. And that is effectively stopping some of our very good innovations to hit the market right now. The government and the standards uh, bodies are uh, uh, looking at all those things, but there is a fundamental lack of skills and talents for people who understand those things, setting technical specifications for all of those products to be able to hit the market. The next one I want to talk about is the commercial angle. These are the people who know how to make changes financially uh, and sustainably. So any startup, any business who is going to introduce a new product, sooner or later, we need to find commercial arrangements through which they can sustain their own business, through which they can protect their own business and interests. Currently, Quite frankly, we don't have enough commercial people who understand net zero and circular economy. That's a significant roadblock in terms of trans transforming our economy and, and jobs market to what it should be. The third box is entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. We had a very good session, very good panel discussion about this topic on Monday afternoon as part of the Net Zero Initiative Conference. But these people, are the key drivers behind all of these massive changes. They are challenge seekers. They are the people who turn every single challenge to an opportunity to create jobs, to create wealth, and to maintain or increase the quality of life for all of us. We need people to be able to support these uh, growth of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who are operating in such organizations to help with that transition. The fourth box is innovation and R&D. These are the people who create the solutions that we need for net zero initiative and circular economy. The solution that do not exist or do exist outside of Australia, but do not exist inside Australia. So in the Australian context, they become innovation. We need a lot more of those skills to be able to um, fill the gaps that we've got. Simita has been recruiting uh, talents all year round since two years ago. And even now, if you put a job applications out there, it takes time for us to find the right talents. So there is a serious shortage of these skills. Community and end users. I cannot emphasize on this point enough. Every single project in net zero and circular economy has a community angle on it. We need a lot of lands to build all of those PVs and solar farms and bean farms and et cetera. We need to ensure that those stakeholders are satisfied. And we need skills to be able to communicate the importance of net zero and circular economy to those stakeholders. We need to bring them on board. I don't think we've got enough of those skills at the moment in our um, um, task force. Very important one, investment, finance, funds, and economy. Every venture, every major project needs financial backers. Financial backers must understand, must have the technical knowledge to know how the carbon markets are going to operate, how all of those things are going to be financed, who is going to take what part of risks when it comes to project financing and early stage investment in startups or research even. These are the people who add fuel to the decarbonization journey and the and circular economy fire that we are going to create. And last but not least, engineers, installers, 
operators, educators that you just talked about, consultants, all of them are part of this whole um, cycle. So you can see the challenge is immense with all the number of jobs that you have to create, all the skills that you need to be able to bring on board to make the boards of the companies make the right decisions, understand the decarbonization targets, set the right educated targets, science-based targets for all of us to target for and aim for. We need a lot of investment in this space. And these gaps that we have identified are not theoretical. These gaps are what we feel and experience every day at Simita Ventures. Simita Ventures as a co company who brings scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs together to solve some of the toughest challenges that we are facing in the economy, sees roadblocks across all of these sectors that I shared with you. We see projects not get funded because of this. We see projects um, getting stopped because the investors don't get enough confidence from the regulators that those emission reductions are being uh, um, are being are being recognized um, by the um, uh, big bodies. Simita's mission, as um, Tim uh, pointed out, is to create a sustainable future by bridging the gap between scientific findings and real-world applications through accelerated technology development and commercialization. Commercialization is key to drive all of those things. Some of them are for new technologies. Some of them are for technologies that are already existing outside Australia, but need to be brought to Australia. And with that, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Much appreciated. A great insight from the scale-up industry perspective. Now we're going to have a presentation or a discussion from Mark Epthorpe. Dr. Mark Epthorpe was appointed as New South Wales' first electricity infrastructure jobs advocate by the Minister for Energy in February 2022. This role requires Mark to provide advice to the Minister for Energy on initiatives to optimise jobs and the transition to renewable energy in New South Wales. The role also requires Mark to provide advice on road, rail and port infrastructure to support the growth of, a, of an energy-related export industry. Mark has an extensive management career, predominantly in transport and logistics, industrial services, mining services, and construction. His most recent role was as a lecturer in management at Newcastle Business School. He is also the current chair of the Hunter Plant Operator Training School Limited, HPOTS, in the Hunter section of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, CILT. It's a great pleasure to welcome Mark along today to give his perspective in a global sense on this challenge. Thanks, Mark. Great, thank you. Okay, so what do we need to do to get it all up here again? So we stop Technology. sharing first. Technology, yes. Okay, stop <laughs> sharing. Okay, we can, we can go, we'll just look at what we've got on the screen. Uh, we'll find you in this. That scale that and business the talent kind of it's off tonight. That's it. Go into presentation mode. Yeah. Let's just get this into sharing screen mode. And we have shared the screen. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. Um so uh, this role of the electricity infrastructure jobs advocate, basically, um, uh, where do I push the button to move on? Push this one. No? Okay. Okay. So the uh, electricity infrastructure roadmap, basically, um, given life, it's the, um, uh, the the roadmap to take New South Wales from um, coal-fired power to renewables power and electricity, and uh, it was given. I guess, policy life um, in um, the Electricity Investment Act of 2020. And my role is set out in that act. And uh, it says to give advice to the minister on 
uh, all sorts of things that can help optimise jobs in the transition to renewables, plus around road, rail and port for an export industry. So I commenced in the role in, um, in, Jan in March and I've been busily running around talking to lots and lots of stakeholders. And the reason we're doing this is because in New South Wales, we've got five coal-fired power stations at the moment. Those five power stations are getting older and will be retired. Uh, some firms, um, such as... Um, Origin Energy decided to, they're going to retire the Araring plant earlier um, and uh, Bayswater may retire a bit earlier. So basically as each one of those retires, those coal-fired power stations retires, we need to be putting something into the grid to be able to have power for everybody. And so that something will be the five renewable energy zones. And so these five renewable energy zones will be um, around New South Wales. So there's one in New England, one in central West Arana, one down the southwest, one in uh, the Hunter Central Coast, and one in the Illawarra. And um, so the capacity is planned to be 12 gigawatts out of those over the next, um, by the 2030, which is about the capacity at the moment. And so what is a, a renewable energy zone? Basically, they're zones where private developers are encouraged to actually set up renewable generation. So it'll be predominantly wind and solar. There'll also be pumped hydro. There'll also be um, batteries in there. There's some other innovative things that people are looking at as well. And so within each zone, and there's a whole process of setting up these zones, a whole lot of legal administrative processes. But once that's set up, there are what they're calling LTESs, long-term energy supply agreements, that help encourage, provide basically a financial backstop for developers to set up these generation in these zones. Linking that together, you have sitting in the center of all of this, a group, a company that's set up, that's wholly owned by the New South Wales government called Energy Co. And part of their role is to also put in the transmission lines. So, um, can we go back one? Yeah. So in each of these zones, there will be a significant amount of new transmission lines put in. So say through the central West Arana, um, up at New England and out the Southwest. So there'll be a lot of transmission put in that allows each of the new generators, the renewable energy generators, to have transmission lines that they can hook into to get their power across the state. And there'll be additional transmission to link it all together. So we go from basically four power stations, coal-fired power stations sitting around Newcastle and one down there at Mount Piper, uh, to a much spread out spread of renewable energy across the state and the transmission lines to actually link it all together. The process of doing these renewable energy zones, they go through what's called a uh, registration of interest to start with for each zone be, to see if who would like to actually build something in these zones. And because there's political certainty there and uh, legal certainty and under this act, there has been huge enthusiasm for this. So of the five renewable energy zones, there's been 372 responses come in. Um, if you put, added them all together, if they all happen, it would be 152 gigawatts of capacity, which is more than 12 times what was being looked for. So there's a lot of interest um, from all different businesses to be able to be part of this. And they're also adding to that for the ones on the, the coast, Hunter Central Coast and Illawarra. There's also been interest in offshore wind. Um, and there's a whole range of, um, I guess, hydrogen projects that aren't really part of my remit, but also there's some real interest in that as well. So from all of that interest, basically there'll be a process that rolls out tenders across these renewable energy zones over the next five to seven years that will then provide all that energy by around 2030. And so there's a huge amount of opportunities there. Um, the opportunities are right across, so from the early planning and approval stage, and there's a lot of work to be done on any of these projects uh, in the planning approval stage. Then you have the construction sta stage, which is the biggest part, uh, employs the most people, has the most materials, and then you go into the operations stage. And there's also opportunities for renewables manufacturing, including export. Um, there'll be the Renewable Manufacturing Fund, all the details of which will be announced shortly. Um, and so that provides a whole lot of opportunities for uh, businesses for, to collaborate. And there's a real emphasis on trying to get SMEs involved. Uh, there's one of the entities that's set up, it's called the Renewable Energy Sector Board. And they've set up a plan that's been taken up by the, those running these tenders 
to put some um, hard numbers around local content and around employees of uh, employing apprentices, um, number of developing uh, people, skills, um, First Nations, all of those sorts of things. So there's a strong focus on social license, a huge amount of jobs to be created. Um, and these will be not just for a year or two, but they'll be running for quite a while. All of that is great. And we've got all these jobs that are, that'll be um, part of all of this. Um, and so this graph is a little bit out of date now, but it's still in relative terms close enough. Um, so you're going to need a huge amount of people to be able to build all of this electricity infrastructure, um, which is a bit of a tough ask at this point in time. As I've gone around and talked to everyone around the, the state, the first thing they tell me is that you can't get workers. Um, the second thing they tell me is even if you can find them, there's no housing for them. So there's some really big things for the, um, for the state to be looking at in all of this. Um, so you've got a shortage of workers in, um, across all the major parts of these projects. So the construction managers, engineers, uh, civil engineers, a lot of the riggers, the technicians, the people that work on the, the wind technicians. So there's shortages in all of those. And so part of all the things that I'm looking at, what are the things we can do to try and deal with all of that? Um, and of course, the focus is about jobs in those renewable energy zones and how do we actually maximise jobs in each of those zones and get really good social outcomes in each of those renewable energy zones. Um, so some of the things I'm focusing on, part of my role was to provide a report to the minister, uh, which I've done, and um, this, that highlights a number of focus areas for the next 12 months. Um, so just some of those that relate to the topic today, Increasing the workforce supply. Um, this, even though unemployment is incredibly low, there are really high pockets of unemployment in certain age groups and certain demographics um, in, in different, in, in, well, basically in all those renewable energy zones. Um, and so looking to see how do we actually activate all of that. So, and then you have also Anecdotal evidence, there's a high number of underemployed. It's very hard to get data, um, granular data about the underemployed. Uh, but again, there's, um, it appears there could be real opportunities to um, bring people forward and provide extra skills and training to be able to take them into these projects. Um, so we're working with a whole range of different government agencies around that and how do we actually identify those people and what are the strategies to one, provide the workforce for these projects, but also to benefit those people who will become involved. Also identifying and addressing skills and training gaps. Um, as I went around and spoke, there was a consistent feedback that at this point in time, there's no clear understanding of the skills and training required for these resources. There's a, a number of studies that have been done, but um, we've, and there's a couple to be finished. And so we're working again with the different government departments, uh, especially Training Services New South Wales, on how do we actually get that very clear so we can then start to put in some strategies around setting up those skills and training. Also, as we went around uh, to the regional areas, consistent feedback that the, um, the system just doesn't deliver the ability to do that training. Uh, it was consistent was that uh, the TAFE system or the TAFE um, colleges out there aren't able to provide the training in the areas where it's needed at the moment or the, provide the right type of training. So up in New England, where you've got a huge amount of projects around the Armadale area, if you want to do an electrical trade, you've got to go to Tamworth. That, that's sort of a typical example of the sort of things that are seen right across. Um, so, and you've got the, the lots of facilities there, um, training facilities, um, where the, those universities or those TAFE colleges aren't providing the, the courses that are going to be good for the re renewable energy zone. So trying to understand what do we do with that? What are the options? Is, do we need new training facilities? Um, how do we need to upgrade training facilities, mobile training options, looking at all of those? And I guess the, the, the about um, the careers and actually, and it sort of relates to the STEM side, um, there's um, consistent feedback that needing to push back into the schools to make students aware that of the opportunities for these um, jobs, the many, many different types of jobs in uh, the renewables industry. 
from everything from um, labouring through to trade, through to um, engineering, through to um, social science um, skills and being able to do all the community liaison, a whole range of jobs are needed. Um, and so looking to try and work out with working with the Department of Education, independent schools, how do we actually push back into the schools to be able to get that information there and to be able to provide that workforce over the next 10 years or so? And that's it, very quickly. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. And we've got some time now for some questions and answers. So we've got a, I'm sure we've got a chat room here and happy to take any questions. I mean, I can see some really powerful connections between Stuart's discussion and all the other speakers, but I mean, Mark was talking about the school's dimension and uh, that's where the STEM Academy is coming from, I believe. Mobin's identifying a number of different facets of knowledge and skills and capabilities areas in different facets of this quite complex question. And we're seeing at this university this, this demand and dimension, not just through MIPS, but also personally myself, as I was just saying to Stuart before we, as we were meeting, Normally I get about five to 10 inquiries from companies saying, do you have a good student for us in, in this area? This year it's peaked at 27 and about 20 of them are in this circular economy, net zero, renewable sustainability management area. It's just gone ballistic this year. It's an absolute cliff off the cliff or up the cliff. Uh, experience and and that's where we've got to we've got to connect there that all round a lot better but questions okay moment one just popped in okay Catherine Wannan I know we've talked about a number of actions to address the talent shortage across our economy what do you think are the highest priority actions to solve the talent shortage so we could have people coming forward or we could do just hand round the any takers the uh microphone i think it's good. I, open's got something I, that's got a perspective to share okay right <laughs> No, that's fine. Like, I think it's probably easier because no one can see us. Oh, okay. Good idea. Oh, they, they, they want to see a face, do they? So you want yeah. to stop sharing that presentation? Oh, or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hearing me. See a face. See a face. Okay. Share. That's great. Now we can see the... You know, I, I just would, would deal with one aspect of the question, and that is how do we accelerate? And... Uh, to accelerate, you, you've got to have a leveraging um, factor in play. And in terms of accelerating STEM capability, the leveraging factor are STEM teachers, because every teacher can, can leverage to 30, 40 students and so on. So um, trying to, to get STEM teachers uh, in sufficient quantity which is today an issue for the schooling system, but then uh, insufficient quality as well. Uh, and the university is trying to do that with the, uh, with the academy, but the teachers would be my focus uh, in terms of trying to accelerate the supply chain uh, for talent. Great comment there, Stuart. Mark. I guess really, um, um, we really need to bring more some more people into the country. <laughs> it's a big thing we need to do right from the get go. Uh, but certainly, in the sort of things that I'm involved in is basically trying to make people aware of these opportunities. Basically, as I've gone around, most people have no idea of, of any of this is happening um, and the, the opportunities there. So I think that's the first thing is from 
from where I am, the part of the work that I'm involved in is just making people aware that there are these opportunities out there. Great comment there, Mark. Logan. I think it would be um, it's interesting because we'll, have, we'll give three different answers to the same question. Um, so I think um, from, from my point of view, um, uh, decision makers um, are of very high priority to educate them as, as quickly as possible about the impact of net zero. Um, because if they don't uh, uh, make the right decisions on time, none of these projects are going to get kicked off um, on time. So there will be... Um, there will be a, a, a very important piece around ensuring um, all of those decision makers are across the importance of net zero. They all have net zero targets for, for the organizations and also all the C-level uh, people in the organizations are also aligned on that front so that decisions can be made, projects can get kicked off, you know, education will be required and also future uh, STEM uh, skills task force will be also ready there. Mm, great answer there, Marvin. You know, if I could just uh, make a, a little supplementary comment, uh, one of the the characteristics of the academy is that uh, yes, there are programs here at the university, but most of the academy work takes place in regional New South Wales. <clears throat> I mean, uh, they'll be in Ballina next week, for example, uh, Orange, Wagga Wagga, um, you know, multiple places because that's where the, what they do is they identify where the, the high school system and the primary school system has a, uh, a, a critical mass and, and the programs are held there so that the teachers don't have to travel all over uh, the place to, just to uh, participate in the program. Uh, and that, that has uh, turned out to be uh, uh, quite valuable. The, the trick then is, to get uh, the people who have the technology, for example, driverless cars, just to pick one. Um, so we have to come back to the university and then beg the driverless car crowd to take their car to Orange <coughs> and preferably keep your hands on the wheel between Sydney and Orange <laughs> Don't test drive it. Um, but that makes a tremendous difference to the teachers understanding as to what the opportunities are because they they can physically see and touch we did the same thing with the um, uh, the robotic uh, uh, agricultural equipment of which the university has taken a leading role in several places like uh, weeding rows of, of uh, plants and so on as well as picking uh, fruit off of trees with with robots um, if you if you really you can talk to young people for hours and not excite them, you put one robot in the field picking apples off of trees and putting them in a bucket, and all of a sudden you have captured the lot. So great answers there. Thanks. Thanks for, for all those contributions. Catherine says, thank you. Any great case studies of things that are being done to address the talent shortage that you can talk to? in addition to the STEM teaching program? <clears throat> Follow-up question from Catherine, thank you. Mm. Great case studies. Go ahead, Mark. Apart from STEM. Um, I, I guess, I don't know if they're great case studies, but there are, there are quite um, uh, good actions going on in New South Wales. There's a, a team called the REAP team, Regional Industry Engagement Program team, and they're getting around to the schools and they're getting industries in each in regions involved with the schools and programs. Um, and um, that is uh, having lots of benefits. And they've now opened that up to focus a lot more on the kind of um, the type of skills that will be involved in um, in the renewable energy projects, um, which, which could be a real benefit to us in those areas. Um, I see there's another um, regional development, um, Australia in the Hunter. They have a program where they go to schools working um, to promote careers in the defence industry. And they've had um, incredible success with that. And one of the things they do there is they use virtual reality and they take in the goggles and the, the gear and, and that, that's having great success with them as well. Great. Our case study is probably not that big, but I think what you are doing every day um, is um, try to educate the the, ta the the talent market more about what what exciting projects and technologies they can work on in our company, 
And a, a lot of people, when they come and see what we do, they completely, you know, um, become interested and they, the, the horizon in terms of the, you know, the career they, they think they think they could have in other places, it just opens up and the impact that they can have just opens up. So, um, and as a result, um, uh, they become really devoted to the type of projects that we are involved in, which obviously are job creative, uh, creating projects, all of them for the companies that we are helping. Great, great answers there. And the final question from Magdalena Toff to everyone, <clears throat> would you see a place for education to industry partnership, i.e. apprenticeships and scholarship for STEM students in schools from companies that are looking to foster circular economy focused STEM students? Would you see a place for education to industry partnership? I, okay. the, the, yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, uh, I guess as we're starting to roll out these renewable energy projects, one of the things that we're looking at in the central West Iran will be the first area to have the projects commence. And we're talking to the the number of um, principal companies who build wind towers, solar farms, et cetera, about how do we get them involved with the schools out there? I know one of those companies is actually taking part in, um, um, in a careers day at one of the high schools out there at Dubbo, um, I think next week. So we've got those things that are happening um, and trying to do more of that and just link it through that, through the, and those, what I found so far is the renewable energy companies, the wind and solar project people are very keen to get involved as well because they want to build a pipeline of people coming to them. Right, Stuart. Well, you know, I, I think there is a uh, there's a, just an ongoing um, opportunity for industry and the education slash training sector to. Uh, to get in each other's pockets a little more actively than uh, we may have seen in the past. Um, you know, my experience is that uh, dynamic industry will do a lot of training if uh, if they've got the, the the right incentives around it for access to uh, people who can do the training. Um, in my whole career. Uh, we would do a little bit of training in-house with our research people, but most of the training was carried out by people from outside the company, bringing them into the company to do the training, and then, then they'd go home. But So you use the experts in a particular area to do the training. <laughs> and there was, there was uh, we didn't think of it as a sort of a, a cooperative thing. It was making use of an industry that was out there and a talent pool that was out there and available for that service. I think Australia's got uh, got some room to move in that area. And it might well be with the initiative around renewable energy and so on, that we can see uh, another um, industry develop. And that's the industry of providing training. I mean, high technical competent training for, for people in, uh, in all of the activities that are needed to bring that on. Final comment from Morgan. Yeah, I think I, I, uh, I, I don't have any comment for this question, but I want to add to the mix is, I think we, we need a lot more design engineers. I think there is a lot of question marks around when the whole electricity market goes to 100% renewable electricity, how the market is going to operate uh, as, as a whole. Um, and there are more questions around the cybersecurity aspects of, of such a network. So I think as we go through that, you really need people who are, um, uh, you know, talented, creative, and understand the whole complex ecosystem to be able to put a functioning market together um, for this is to work. Yeah, great comment there, Mobin. And thank you very much, Stuart and Mark, for your inputs today and your comments, answers to the questions. Big thank you to the audience online. I noticed we sort of peaked at about 19 participants. That was pretty good. And a big thank you to co chair and Chief Circular Engineer of Australia, Ali, for, <laughs> for organising this entire event. So thank you very much for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>